We're really delighted that, uh, to have each and every one of you here. And obviously, we are profoundly grateful to Armin Zygmunt for being here, too. Um, so the, this is Insight Sunday, um, which was the brainchild of uh, April Garnick. And the idea is really to um, look through the eyes of artists um, and to talk about their work. So, um, no pressure. <laughs> I think Almond in this community needs no introduction, but we always do enjoy introducing artists. And so it is my great pleasure to be talking to Almond this morning, who is known for her engagement with abstraction and also with geometric uh, designs. Um, you know her work uh, from many, many shows out here as well as in the city. And today we really look forward into diving into the work and also her press process. So precious process. So without any more ado, uh, we will begin. Um, I will sit down. Um, yes. Oh, introduce myself. Apologies. I am the unknown person. <laughs> I am the voice from the ages. Uh, my name is Sarah Cochran, and I am chief curator here at the church. Um, and uh, I will be um, one very small part of this conversation because we're really very interested in hearing from Amand. So, Amand, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amand, I thought that it would be nice um, to start off with uh, the two works that are immediately behind us and which are obviously by you. Um, and uh, perhaps you would like to start by discussing them. Sure. Um, first off, let me thank all of you, April and Eric. Thank you so much for making this um, place for all of us, for the community. Um, it's, yeah, can't thank you enough. Um, Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sara. Thank you to Lena and everybody that's helped me here. Um, I'm not used to doing this. I host an evening. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I've never wanted to actually get up and talk about my work, but I really appreciate the opportunity to do it because I do like talking about my work and I like talking about art generally. Um, so these two pieces uh, are probably the most recent thing out of my studio. They're both um, hand-painted. Um, a lot of people have thought they were prints. Um, they are a process by which I stenciled first and then kind of drew the figures over them. Um, and they actually started as, um, I, I was kind of making, I've been doing a lot of collage for the past couple of years and I was making paper for which to collage. And I made these two patterns, um, and they were just hanging in my studio for a long time. And I decided I'd like them too much to cut them up. And I had cut up other patterns that I'd made, and there's actually um, a show right now in Bridgehampton that Anne Fristo put together um, from the Libra collection. And on view there, there are a couple of pieces that I did use um, made patterns from and then cut and used in the sort of collage way. Um, but these, all of a sudden, um, they were just calling to be their own thing. And so I had been working with a sort of figurative motif for a while, and this is just what happened. And part of my process, or a big part of my process, is really just letting things be for a long time until I can see something that I want them to become. So, like I said, these paper pieces hung in my studio for about three months, and then within a period of, I think, two weeks, became these. And it's sort of, um, it, these things are kind of iterative in that this will then go on to become something else. They're, um, they're 
small sculptures that I'm working on in my studio that sort of refer to this. So there's a kind of back and forth dialogue in terms of how, you know, how things are made and um, where these pieces sit within that timeline. So, yeah. I think another really interesting thing in these works in particular, but across your work more broadly, is this tension between kind of abstraction and geometry. Can you talk a wee bit about that? Um, yes. It's interesting because I don't actually think of myself as an abstract artist at all. Um, I do use geometry, um, but I think of myself, I think mostly as an appropriator. <laughs> you know, I look at the world um, and I take things that I like from it and I put it into my work. And um, textile, pattern, design has all been something that's been um, very important and very generous in terms of, you know, my um, uh, trifling through a whole history. And um, I think we live in a really sort of um, maddening but also totally uh, fruitful time in that we just have access to so much information. You know, we just have access to so much um, uh, historical but also visual information. And so I just, I, pattern and textile has always been really important to me. Um, I think it has something to do with just my history and my grandparents' trades and, but also this idea of being able to trace time, history, political environments, um, cultural, um, you know, connections through this alternative language of pattern, which is super interesting to me. Um, so, you know, that maybe falls on the geometry side. And the abstract side, I think, is, is really how I try to make movement, tension, dynamism, like, and that's what excites me in art is some sort of pressure, you know, a point where two things are pulling or pushing against each other. Um, and so that, I think, is maybe the crux of, of that, um, you know, that relationship. I mean, the interesting thing about pattern is that it is um, expansive. In other words, you set up a set of shapes and then they can be kind of um, broadened almost to the infinite. Um, I find that interesting given that so much of your practice would appear to be generative one to the next in a specifically pointed way in your work. Is that a misinterpretation? Well, Generative in that, no, it's not a misinterpretation. I think, <laughs> I think in some ways, I, um, when I look back on a series of work that I've done, or even you know, many years, I see connections that I wasn't thinking of consciously at the time. And so I think um, I've learned to sort of trust myself in that even if I'm not thinking about it um, with, super specific intention that there is a thread and that, you know, yes, these things build on each other. Um, I'm also a very slow worker. You know, I don't, and part of that is just because of my life, but part of that I think is that I'm just careful. I'm, you know, thoughtful to a fault um, where these things sort of stew for a long time, like I said, this work didn't take a very long time to make physically, but it took five months to sit, you know, before I could do something. Um, and the reason that I didn't cover up because I trusted the intent, you know, the intuition that I had not to, but I had no idea what I was going to do with that. So um, there is, I think my way of, working is very somatic and that I feel things in my body, you know, and I just kind of let them be for a long time. And 
which is kind of funny because I do a lot of projects that have these really short deadlines, um, which is very stressful to me, <laughs> you know. But um, but it's also good. I'm I'm good with a deadline in some ways, and sometimes I need the little, the push. But um, yeah. So I think. Was that your question? <laughs> Did that answer it? <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting, this thing about feeling it in your body, because mm. obviously one of the um, interesting points of your work is the way a certain amount of vocabulary fits into both 2D work, but then also into sculpture. So the idea of illusionary space, mm. I think both in the 2D work, but then obviously how it translates to your sculpture, um, is something else that is uh, obviously not peculiar to you, but is specific to the work and perhaps also the way you work. Yeah, it's it's actually a really f interesting tension that I've been um, sort of lucky enough to be able to explore and also unlucky enough to have to explore because, um, you know, because I have been given the opportunity to do sculpture um, on a large scale, which has been great, but it also has sort of set up this um, situation where I, I have to try to figure out how to take these sort of complete worlds that I create in the 2D work and translate them into the world of the 3D work and take everything that, um, you know, that I want people to experience with my work, with the the you know, with the color, the the form, the tension, and kind of make that discrete, you know, bring it into the pieces and have them translate that. So you know, with two D work, you can kind of you know um, you can set out what it is that you want to say and have that be sort of a contained world. With three D work, you don't have that opportunity in the same way because it, it's going to interact with the surroundings, you know, um, and for me in, you know, the cases, um, they've been, the surroundings have not been, um, they're not white boxes, they're, you know, they're vibrant and, and, um, and places that have um, either lives already being lived or, you know, business being done. And so I'm not totally positive if I've been completely successful at that. And it's something that I've been actively thinking about and trying to solve in my studio. And that's actually why I've come back and I'm are making smaller sculptures, what my dealer likes to call tabletop. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's really more of an effort to work out that, you know, that, um, that problem of, of, because sculpture presents so many problems um, beyond the sort of you know theoretical one of translating you know intention into um, in three dimensions, but the problem of making them you know how do you finance it? Um, what material, especially if it's outside, what material do you you know um, go to, to so that it doesn't fall apart but keeps the integrity of whatever it is that you're trying to do? Um, there's a lot of questions that, you know, you have to solve, yeah. And, you know, you, you have, your work has been talked about as being site responsive. Mm -hmm. And obviously this is what your, your, your meaning is this idea of understanding the environment and then understanding how the work will fit into it. Yes. Um, are there, is there an example where you feel that has worked in the most successful way? Mm. You have to choose between the darlings. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I uh, there was a couple of murals that I did that I feel like are, and I I want to say there's one in a parking garage that I really love, and I didn't think that I would, but. Um, because it's a parking garage, but in some ways that perfectly encapsulates some of the things that I want art to do, and that's to kind of live and, you know, in unexpected places and to sort of bring 
um, you know, joy and reflection during a time, you know, during the day that you wouldn't necessarily expect it. Um, but there are also pieces that I have done, you know, before I arrived in this area that in some ways um, do that. You know, I, I just did a piece uh, last summer that is probably the biggest commission that I'd ever done, and it exists in, a, um, in an embassy in Paraguay. And I'm sure many of you have heard me talk about it. But that was the most confounding piece because I do consider myself site responsive, and I and one of the reasons I like that word and I in, I sort of position myself that way is because I do not think of myself as the kind of artist that makes monolithic pieces. I don't make pieces about me, about you know that I just place somewhere. I want to make something that is. Um, that's generous in the way that it kind of relates to, you know, where it's going to live. Um, and often that is the architecture, you know, um, but this piece became about um, sort of the country more because I had no access to the architecture. There was no plans, there were no, um, there was very, very little information. It was all state secrets, you know, like nobody was giving me anything. I had no planting, you know, this is in an outdoor area. So it really challenged me to try to take all of the idea of responsiveness and just put it into the work, you know, and I did a lot of research about Paraguay and um, uh, the indigenous craft, but I also had to think, you know, what is my connection to Paraguay? Just as a person, as an artist, I have none. I'm, you know, the only thing I could come up with was uh, Paraguay was a haven for, um, for uh, Nazis. <laughs> and my family survived the war, so, or some of them did anyway. So, you know, that was, that was like a weird, you know, so I kind of had to put that aside and just kind of start to <laughs> to kind of like look, okay, what are the things that I find beautiful here? And there was actually, it was interesting because Paraguay, I think that when I was doing the research, there was a, an article in the Times um, about the sort of um, the humble architecture, the humble modernist architecture of Paraguay. And it was, you know, um, it's a country that uh, was sort of, uh, ravaged by its dictator and left in a horribly economic, you know, horrible economic um, uh, situation. And so the architects that were living there were using these really humble materials, concrete, muds, and making these gorgeous and kind of combining that with the traditional, you know, language of, um, of, of the area um, and making just these beautiful structures and so I used a lot of that in the language you know of the work the patterns that I used and um, so but it just to go back it it was a real challenge you know to not be site responsive in that way and so that's kind of why I'm still looking at that piece wondering is this is it successful I don't know I'm not totally you know willing to you know I to say that it is I'm, I'm still thinking about it um, so the pieces that I feel like are the most um, successful in that respect are the ones I think that, uh, I don't know, have like a little bit more sort of a tongue-in-cheek, mm -hmm. you know, I did a, an installation in the 7-Eleven once and I love that piece so much um, because it's just, it's, maybe because it's irreverent, but it's also, it was really meant to be loving, you know, to the 7-Eleven. Like there was something that was very um, genuine about my, it was a 7-Eleven that was right next to my studio when I lived in Las Vegas. And I really wanted, I went there every day and I wanted to give something to it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so that brings up a, a, an interesting question. Um, which is about your audience for the site responsive pieces. When you were making those pieces, how much 
do you think about the audience? Um, I think about the audience a lot. Um, and I think it kind of, I think, gets to the sort of fundamental heart of where I think art should live. And I think that's everywhere for everyone. You know, so I don't think about an art audience quite as much as I do a larger audience. Um, I feel very strongly about the idea that art should live beyond the sort of, you know, rarefied um, world that most of us live in. And, you know, I love the world that we live in. I chose to live in this world. But I also feel very strongly that um, there is too much of a divide or too much of a, a sort of gulf between, you know, the world we live in and the world that everybody lives in, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And that brings us to a really interesting point, which is um, your graduate work with Dave Hickey. Um, obviously somebody who was interested in ideas of, I mean, first of all, ideas that perhaps are more akin to the West Coast than the East Coast. Um, the idea of making artwork in the West. Um, and then also these ideas of perhaps different standards for looking at artwork. I mean, I'm sure that was a formative experience in your life. I would be interested in hearing, you know, what that experience was like at the time and then how that experience, you reflect upon it now. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because um, I... Um, I was telling Zara before um, we started, I, I got out my thesis last night to so <laughs> my MFA brave. thesis. <laughs> I did kind of read it with one eye closed, um, but it, um, it, 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 it stood up. I don't know if the writing stood up, but the ideas stood up. And um, it also, because the way that I wrote it was sort of, um, I mean, thesis are defense. Right, so that's the idea. But it I, it was kind of a sort of historical, you know, I took my defense to be a kind of way um, of just cataloging, you know, my time up until then and where I had started. And, and one of the things that I wrote, because uh, I, I went to art school in New York. I grew up in New York um, in the city and um, one of the things that I wrote was something to the effect of um, I made objects, something like I made objects and then I coded those objects with words to be important or something like that. Like that's what I was doing when I was in New York. And I was very aware at the time that you needed to have really big ideas for art to be important. And I just didn't feel like I had that much to say or that what I was being pushed to say was the thing that I wanted to say. At the time, identity politics was really, you know, important and I didn't, I, I didn't want to talk about myself. I didn't want to use myself, even though I did in my work at that time. But um, I was working for an artist at the time and we installed a show in LA and um, I was out there at Patty Four's gallery, and she said, I loved Patty, she said, well, you should go out and look at my friend Dave in Las Vegas. And, and I kind of knew Dave's name. I had um, uh, The Invisible Dragon. Um, I'm not sure that I had read it, but I had it. <laughs> um, and I, I just, after that trip, I just knew that I wanted to be on the West Coast. You know, I think I wanted to go to UCLA. I just, I wanted to be on the West Coast. I felt like there was a freedom there. I could shed the sort of what felt like the yoke of theory or politics. Um, the, the, the aesthetic in New York at that time was also very abject. It was, you know, um, there was very little being done in terms of materiality and even color and 
So I just, um, yeah, I felt depressed by that. So when I went to LA, I was like, oh my God, I can make things, I can use color, I can, you know, all of these things that had been sort of peeking out in my work because I was using a lot of fabric at that time. Um, but I was covering it with latex and, you know, just doing all of this. Um, my painting teacher at the time was Meryl Wagner, who is Robert Ryman's wife, and she came in and she's just so sweet. She said, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, just keep doing it, but I don't have anything to say. I was like, okay. Um, so that was like that, I think that in some ways was, um, yeah. So anyway, I, I think I wound up in Las Vegas very much by accident. You know, um, I was determined not to pay for graduate school. They were the only school that gave me money. So, and I found out very late in the year in terms of, I think I found out in June. And at that point, I had already considered not going to school and not making art anymore. And when I found out that I'd gotten a full fellowship, and a teaching assistantship. Um, I got on a plane and I was like, I guess I just need to go and check this out. Driving down the strip, I was like, how can I not do this? This place is so fucking weird. I have to try this, you know, like I have to come here. And like I said, I didn't even really know Dave at that time, but after the first class I had with him, I was like, oh, I'm totally in the right place. You know, and at that point he was probably you know, at the top of his iconoclasm, you know, in terms of him just spewing vitriol at the whole of the art world. And it was super exciting, <laughs> basically. I mean, he wasn't only that. And I think that's actually what I realized after that. Um, he was much more than that, but he, I think, and still gets sort of painted as that person. Um, which is unfortunate, but maybe history will forget that part of him. I mean, it's interesting the way you're kind of positioning this shift, um, that you go from kind of an abject aesthetic to what at the time in the West Coast would have been a kind of slacker mm. aesthetic. I mean, it was colorful, but it was deliberately sloppy. Yeah. Was that an influence, or was that something you fought against? No, it's actually funny, because once I actually got to Las Vegas, yeah. I realized there was a world of difference between Las Vegas and L.A. also. Um, and it was funny, because we would go to L.A., and people would say, oh, you're the Las Vegas kids, you know? And that was, that was a very specific thing. And it was interesting, because a lot of people that... There were two kinds of people in Las Vegas that were in that graduate program. People that came because of Dave and knew Dave, and the people that just wound up there and really had very little, um, even larger knowledge of a bigger art world and didn't really have that much interest in what that was. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that you say that because it became, the process in Las Vegas became the thing that, um, and when I say process, I mean more like technique. Um, and, you know, Dave would come into your studio and his critiques were, well, I like that one, make more of them, make them bigger and make them pink, you know? And we all sort of chuckled because nobody took his advice, you know, it, but it was, what he was doing was just permission to do whatever the fuck you wanted. Like you didn't, he wasn't trying to mold you into a certain thing. And it became very um, clear to me that in Los Angeles, that was what was happening. There was the, you know, there were the camps under different teachers. And it was a very sort of blase, you know, slacker aesthetic. Um, and I realized quickly that I probably actually wouldn't have liked it there. Um, cause as sort of soft spoken as I am, when somebody tells me to do something, I, you know, <laughs> it really bristles me. <laughs> um, so it was kind of, I didn't realize it. 
And again, it's sort of like the somatic thing. Like, I don't know really what I want to do, but I'm going to listen to my gut. And my gut is telling me to go to Las Vegas. And it was, yeah, it, it was where I needed to be. Um, yeah, and continues. So how did you, or, or what were the, the thinking, what was your thinking that went into after Las Vegas? I mean, I think there's always that enormous pull for graduate students to sort of stay. And obviously that didn't happen to you. So what was that thinking? Yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. Um, that thinking was, a, you know, a person saying, we have this opportunity here in this community. And uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to come with us or do you want to go? that way so um it was it was the hardest decision i've ever made and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say that i sometimes wonder what would have happened had i gone that way um but that being said i've been able to continue working uh, i know a lot of people that i went to graduate school with uh don't and there's a handful of us that do and we stay in touch um, and I think that it's actually a very real problem that artists face, um, just in how do you continue working after school? School is this amazing sort of fabricated community of intensity and ideas and, you know, where you're just focused on this one thing and it all feels so important and it's, uh, so invigorating. And then you get out of school and you have to figure out how to maintain a relationship with your studio, um, create other communities, um, and if you want to pursue you know, uh, a professional career path, that's a whole other level of you know, engagement with your studio and your community. And you know, so um, it's, I'm not gonna say that it's been easy, but I will say this community, not to pat us all on the backs, but there are a lot of people in this community that take their work really seriously and are engaged on a level that um, is very inspiring. And, you know, we exist on different levels in terms of our, you know, um, really I'm just going to say our market, because that's, that's really what it is. Um, but there is a real, I don't know, a strong tendency towards making, and I feel lucky to have landed in that. So, you know, regardless of whether or not sometimes would rather be on the West Coast, um, I think it's always good to have a place that you want to live in. So I'd, if I'd lived in LA, then I wouldn't have that place, so. We, we obviously want to open this up for questions, um, but I think there's two things we want to do before that. Um, one is I have a, another question for you, and then I know that you have a question for the audience. Oh, yeah, what was it? Um, I <laughs> hoped you would remember. Let's, let's talk about my question, and we'll, we'll feel our way towards that. Um, uh, I would like you to sort of reflect on your time here on the East End and maybe try to define what the site specificity of working here has um, allowed in the evolution of your work or perhaps if there's something you have fought against as you have been working here. That's a good question. Um, I have thought about that, and it's funny, when I first, one of the things that got me to first move out here, or that sort of uh, allowed me to kind of entertain the idea, was I, I lived out here, I think, in 1990, the summer, and um, I took a class at the Art Barge, I discovered Jackson Pollock's grave, um, Annalene de Kooning, um, I'm sorry, Lee Krasner. Um, I just, I kind of, there was a little part of me that fell in love with the uh, romance of 
that history because I was already sort of enamored of it. Um, but when I moved out here, finding a studio was really hard. Um, I had a studio on top of the first iteration of the restaurant that my husband and his partner opened. Um, I worked over there for many years, and um, when and then I kind of moved around all over the place. Um, and then when I finally was able to build a studio, which um, you know, 15 years ago was possible. Um, there was the question of the light because that's why everybody comes out here. It's the light, and um, and the architect that I was working with was like, "Well, do you want a bay of windows at the, you know?" It's like, "No, can I just have all wall and fluorescence?" <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I realized one of the things is I live in the woods, and so I don't get the great light. You know, like that light is from the fields, and I mean, and if you live near the water, the reflective light. There's, but um, but I realized in that moment that. I'm not quite sure how much I've been influenced by my, you know, surroundings. Um, and I think that that sort of persists. I think that a lot of what I get um, is from my community in terms of the art they're making, you know, seeing other art. Um, but it's, it, I think that a lot of where, what I, am working on comes from, I don't want to say an escape, but just an imaginary, you know, a place that I imagine that is filled with just every reference that I love, <laughs> you know, whether it's Bauhaus, ballet, um, uh, I don't know, you know, Kente cloth, they're just, there's, the world of sort of reference is, is vast, and um, I feel like there's a sort of parallel in as much as the, what I see as being a, a, something that I get from being out here is really just the support of, you know, a great community. Um, and the luck of living in a beautiful place and having a family and a situation that allows me to make work, um, which I don't take for granted. And, um, you know, having the restaurant over the years has been confusing, you know, for me professionally, because um, I think there has been an assumption that I work at the restaurant because it's my name. And I, in fact, I did because when we first opened, it was all hands on deck. You know, everybody, this one painted and, you know, like all friends and family came together to, you know, get it off the ground. But it was never my thing. It's my, you know, it's my husband's thing. Um, and it's, it's a family business. So, um, so I think in some ways it has been confusing for me as well. Like there's been um, like, who am I? Am I an artist? Am I, you know? But I think that's something just as artists and maybe women as well, we deal with, um, or I've dealt with. And so it's kind of a continuing, you know, it's, it's a ongoing conversation and dialogue that I'm having with myself. But I, I really don't feel, I mean, and I'm probably, incorrect saying this, but I don't feel particularly influenced by the natural, you know. Um, in fact, I think sometimes I sort of, you know, do things that put me in direct um, sort of, uh, not as an adversary, but, you know, like kind of at a perpendicular <laughs> sort of <laughs> angle to that, yeah. Um, so if I remember our conversation, yeah, what was the question? I believe we were talking about kind of illusionism and creating forms within the composition. Yeah. And you, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I believe you were interested if 
that was something people associated with mm. your work? Does that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You guys are on. <laughs> well, I guess I I think you know I've been working with this sort of this figure, you know, and it's something for so long that um, the the work that I was doing was really more sort of environmental, and the idea was that it was creating a space for the figure to sit. And then again, this is another that sort of taking those ideas and putting it into a discrete object. So now kind of creating a figure. Um, and yeah, so I'm curious whether or not it reads like that. or Because these are probably the first pieces that have done that in that, in that way. So um, it's certainly the first pieces that I've used my airbrush on paper. My airbrush is usually just for painting objects. So that was a first. Any reactions? April, Eric, well done, Talina's coming. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that because, or you both asked that, because I have been looking at these for weeks now and really enjoying them. And a lot of people have come through and said, what's that? Who made those? I like those. So there have been a lot of positive reactions to your work, and you know I've mentioned you insofar as I could. But I, I mean, I personally have been wondering about them because I, th I see, when I look at them, because I'm a human, I see head and body, head and body, head and body, and I also see searchlight, and I also see, I'm looking at the one on the right, the, like a sort of a, a kingly fluorescent, person with a, with a fluorescent yellow robe walking, what? And then, I mean, on the other hand, I'm seeing these two, these two figures on the left that are friends, but they're very different. You know, it's just like, I'm projecting like crazy onto them. And I thought, I bet if I ever said this to Alma, she'd go, ew, what's no, wrong with you? But, I'm, I'm but, laughing. but what is, curious is that I in my all my favorite pieces of yours I've always felt like you have this like secret um, I've used this word before and I don't mean to overuse it but it's sort of a secret animation going on so your work is abstract but it has like life in it and and it has prodding like I feel prodded always when I look at your work which I really really like I'm curious about the backgrounds, like how they come about, just because I don't understand why these little guys or people or things, beings, are in front of those backgrounds. I don't, I wouldn't argue it, and if it's just completely accident, cool, but it's, you know, something that makes me curious, but I love that they, I love that they arouse curiosity, and they're so perfect to have had during the run of our Curious Objects show because <laughs> I'm not sure that people coming in, you know, cold from the outside wouldn't think that in some way they're related because they're a fine example of like extremely elevated curiosity in an object, if you know what I mean. So, for what it's worth. Yes, I do know what you mean. And I like all of those associations. And um, the, just quickly, the background is sort of accidental, but kind of not. Also, there are, um, a lot of a lot of the kind of patterns that I like to reference are just really simple, um, you know, kind of block print type stuff that you would see on a dish towel like or sort of known, sort of already a, exactly like found exactly. Have that found they're feeling. like yeah, they're found oh, yeah. they're found patterns. Um, and, but they also come out of like a, just a very simple, you know, di dissection of a grid and, um, you know, chopping up a grid into its various pieces and then, and then putting a, a cherry in the middle of it. So it's, but it, I do think of it as being a kind of a backdrop, a, like you said, a sort of familiar found quotidian object. I mean, I think of these as sort of like a linoleum floor or, you know, some kitchen from some other time. Um, 
that these figures just kind of appear on. So yes, it's that tension between something familiar and something completely, you know, what? invented or yeah. weird. And yeah. then I didn't mean to, I mean, I did say kingly, but I actually like the fact that they're so asexual. I, I could have said queenly equally. It just popped into my mouth. But yeah. um, And then if you make sculptures of these, if these become sculptural or environmental in some way, and I don't know how, I'm looking forward to that. But I'm also wondering, like, it doesn't feel like in this instance that they need to fit in their environment. It seems like they could become their environment in, in their own world, because right. they, I know what you meant about the interior of a 2D thing where you can create and control that. Anyway. Yeah, no, that's exactly the tension. How do they become their environment? That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, actually April uh, articulated pretty much everything I was going to uh, also say, which was, and, and articulated better than I would be able to, um, <clears throat> because I have the same reactions in the sense that as abstracted as they are, um, they're, uh, they're associational. It's, it's hard not to try to ascribe some kind of significance to it or whatever. I, she was going with King. I, I kept seeing it as, you know, sort of a religious figure kind of thing. But, um, but the, uh, this one that I've been looking at again for weeks and especially focused on today is a conversation between two characters of sorts, right? And I was going back and forth and then I saw the, the hatchet head shape and then I saw the disconnected head on the other one and I thought, I thought, oh, this is an interesting conversation and I was thinking, it's, it, we're actually in a, in a quiet moment of contrition mm. <laughs> that, you know, belies the violence <laughs> that caused it. You know. Isn't that what history is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and it's you know to to set a um, uh, you know start to spin uh, that that kind of complex emotional psychological relationship based uh, narrative against you know, playful shapes, uh, you know, bright colors, um, you know, is it, it, a really compelling uh, strategy, I think. Yeah. And the, uh, this piece over here, the, the, you know, sort of is figurative, et cetera, but it also, for me, because of the way the background, which works very differently from one to the other, even though it's the same pattern, but yeah. the, the sort of op art, uh, vibration of this one to me makes it feel like a uh, you punched a hole through it that 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 is you know the head part of the figure right. is also a, a portal into uh, something because the tension between the you know background pushing forward and stuff mm -hmm. so but but I think the you know the strategy for making work uh, this way is incredibly compelling. So oh, thank you. This is the best crit I've had in years. <laughs> since since the church is just self-analyzing at the moment, um, may I join in and say I always assumed this was an asteroid. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. I, I actually also have a question. Sorry, everyone, that the church staff is is taking over this talk. <laughs> but um. <laughs> um yeah, <laughs> we'll get we'll get there. But um, <laughs> um, so um, all of these, you know, when when you came for the install um, and we spoke briefly, um, you mentioned the word extraterrestrial and just mm -hmm. all of these other words that I picked up on today: unnatural, fluorescence. The fact that you spent time in Vegas, I think, is so rad, and also just is very makes a lot of sense now looking at your work and. I'm just wondering, like, talking about the characters, the relationships between them, the tension, are the characters 
is there an emotional drive behind the characters or are you also inspired just by the unnatural relationships between the characters you're forming? I think that the emotional, I think there, it's always empathy. There's always like a love for who they are, even if they are tragic or violent or, you know, because I do think about them um, and they do sort of, um, they do emerge. But I think it's, it's always empathetic. Um, that, that would be the, the overwhelming. Um, and love, like I, I love them. <laughs> yeah. There is a gentleman here. And then there's a question in the back. Sorry, there is a gentleman. I just want to say all art is a Rorschach test, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I guess you're going to get a question from a non-artist. I'm yeah. just a mere lawyer. But in, in all the, in a lot all of the art. years that we've been following you, one of the things that attracted at least me the most was your various use of material shape and color, whether it was neon or wood or those pieces, the name of which I can't remember, but it was on canvas, but it had like... Flocking. The f yes, right. Those are actually on paper. On paper. Yeah. Oh, those are on paper. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and what you're doing now. H how did that change of material um, develop or abandonment of material. I don't think I've seen another neon piece in forever. I do have another neon piece. Oh, do um, you? Oh, yes, okay. I just got it back actually. Um, you know, the neon piece that you have was done, um, that was a very specific installation and I guess I had the opportunity to do, you know, to kind of envision or, or bring together um, or to, to make an installation that had sculpture, wall drawings, you know, I think I painted on the wall in that. Um, and I wanted to use neon, I don't know. And that led to another neon piece. Um, and I've still, I would still like to use neon. It's not so much an abandonment of materials, I guess it's just a sort of the opportunity hasn't come up. Again, um, I still have all my flocking, and the flocking actually was an interesting thing because I started using flocking because I was doing 2D work, but wanted to be doing 3D work, so I was trying to figure out a way to make work on a two-dimensional surface that felt really sculptural and that actually had a, um, you know, a materiality to it. Um, and most of those pieces are highly perspectival, like they're highly illusionistic perspective, you know, either one or two point perspective within them so that they look like they're structures that are, you know, that do have a sort of body to them. And that's what the flocking was all about. I was also really interested in exploring using materials that were excavated from the sort of quotidian, you know, spaces of Las Vegas. And I think those pieces, you know, um, sort of came directly out of that time. Um, yeah. There's a very patient lady right in the back. <laughs> Hi, Anna. I tell her get patient. Hi. Hi. <laughs> all the way back here. Um, so I remember quite a while ago, you and I were talking about the figures and um, how at the time, and I'm wondering if this is still the case, you take these very ancient traditional classical figures out of like art history books and stuff and you kind of just trace the figure right, the around the outside. Yeah. Like instead of getting the three dimension of the sculpture, it would be like a photograph of a sculpture right. that you would then just trace around and get like the basic angles. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it just seems to me that it's become this evolution from doing that and then creating these characters almost in a kind of Philip Guston way where there are these amorphous little guys. <laughs> 
<laughs> keep appearing mm -hmm. everywhere. And um, and the other thing that I I have always loved the the piece you did for the Whalers Museum. Um, it's like one of my favorite mm -hmm. sculptures ever that anyone's ever done. And um, and I see a lot of that in the backgrounds that you're doing now. And to me, like I, when I saw that one in person, it really um, resonated with me the idea of uh, abstract decorative architecture like um, in Islam and ancient Judaism where it's like you're not going you're not really depicting right. the whatever the, the godliness is the figure it's 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 just meant to like a code like signal that that's what it is and I was just wondering if if that comes into play at all in what you're doing yeah I, I think that's certainly um, you have a very good memory, Erica. <laughs> um, I think all of that certainly comes into play. I think um, you know one of the things, one of the things that stayed with me, kind of from my education, was the the sort of the idea, the tension between color and drawing, which has played itself out over centuries, um, and. the implications that it has on a political level, you know, and the implications that it had then, and if any, I'm sure a lot of people know what I'm talking about, but it's the kind of, in Italian, it's like the colori versus the decini, you know, the, the idea that the drawing was the sort of the realm of the mind and was taken more seriously and that color was the, was the sort of less, um, was maybe the more frivolous and um, but was more interested in sort of representing nature um, and it kind of manifests itself in the French Academy also and there's there's a whole and it becomes interesting and I bring it up because it's sort of it goes back to the kind of populist you know sort of stepping over the boundary of um, the the kind of you know, we exist over here in the land of the mind and the art is for those that are educated. Um, where the, the I think they were the, um, the, the Rubenists, right? It was like French versus Flemish. The Rubenists were like, you know, kind of challenging the authority of the French king and sort of saying, well, we're representing nature and we've got all this color and, you know, fuck you. Um, and it was it was dangerous, but so to get back to that, yes, there is the embodiment, you know, and the kind of taking the way, the sort of um, the drawing aspect of it, or the 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 need to describe through drawing and actually just embodying the form is the thing that's kind of interesting to me because it's it's a it describes and affects a relationship with our body, you know, and it's something that you don't need to understand the history to have an experience. It becomes experiential. And that's the thing, ultimately, you know, that interests me in art, if that makes sense. Could you say a little bit more about how you choose your colors? Mm. They, if, if I, for example, saw the background, I would never think of those colors. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, of course, those are the right colors. But um, <laughs> how do you come by them? Um, intuition. I mean, I, I studied color theory and I taught color theory for a while. Not a long time, but some time. And so color has always been something that I've been interested in that um, is, has so much meaning, you know, uh, and has so much ability to bring you people, you know, to a certain place. But it really is just, um, I don't really think about it. It's, it's just what the color needs to be. And I've changed colors, like, you know, I didn't change any colors there. <laughs> that being said, I do a lot of, 
preparatory work on the computer. So I do a lot of color, you know, sort of, um, not mixing, but, you know, comparative color studies before I actually go to paint. Um, but the color, you know, it is incredibly important and it, it's, if it is a little bit off, I know that it's off and I have to change it. So it's, um, but it really is a sort of, again, just a process of sitting and looking. And, you know, sometimes I'll do, if I'm sort of in a, like I don't know if it's gonna work, I'll paint something on a piece of paper and tack it onto the, you know, and then, um, so I, I don't, I don't always get it right the first time, but. Um. So do you paint one color and then decide on the other color, or do you on the computer get the whole color scheme? It depends. Sometimes, it, it depends. Sometimes I paint one color and then, you know, then I'll have to figure out. Like with these, I painted the background and then I think I painted, I knew that I wanted that pink in there, or maybe it was the green actually. Yes, the green was first. And then I think I went to the computer and started, you know, kind of putting different possibilities in. But there's also, there's kind of, you know, there's themes that are repeated. Um, yeah, thank you. There was a question here. Hi, I'm Lulu. I'm a filmmaker and a podcast host. Thank you so much, both of you, the commentator and uh, Almond, for um, all the stuff you spoke. I took so much notes. I learned so much. Thank you so much. And it didn't occur to me that the restaurant is, oh, that makes so much. It didn't occur to me until moments just now that I was like, wow. Cause I, I'm glad that it didn't I love you. the lobster mac and cheese I eat all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, to, to kind of transition from the um, details and the ins and out of the art itself to the larger picture, uh, my question is, what are some challenges or risks that you faced and how were you able to solve them creati creatively? Because like, I'm a sucker for quotes, so one quote that I like is, uh, high risk equals high rewards. So what are your thoughts on that and how were you able to use creativity to solve your challenges? Good question. Yeah. I, don't know. Um, I don't often think of myself as a big risk taker, but um, I actually would say that these pieces would embody that. And so I've begun to think of these, and even before I brought them here, I began to think of these pieces as sort of transitional pieces. Because, like I said, I made the pattern background. Um, and it doesn't seem like a high risk to then go on and paint on top of it. But in some ways, it kind of is, because it was a lot of time, a lot of effort, you know, to create that background. And um, it's all done by hand. I mean, I use a spray gun, but, you know, the stencil is really small. And so, you know, so it actually felt like a big risk to go and paint these on top of that. And it might not seem it, um, but I think that in the larger sort of picture of, I don't know, my own uh, narrative about my work in my head, this, these were incredibly risky. Um, so, um, and I guess the fact that we're sitting here maybe means that it's high reward, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I could probably, I don't know. Risk is a funny thing because I think that, you know, there are people that seem to be obvious risk takers and then there are people that, I think being an artist is a risk, you know. Um, so, I, I think I've kind of normalized it, um, but I've had a lot of help from a lot of people along the way, so maybe it doesn't feel quite as risky anymore. Um, but yeah, I'll have to I'll have to think about that. I mean, the the saying yes to doing a public sculpture continues to be a risk, <laughs> you know. Like that's that was a big risk, um, 
And I'm not sure if that was rewarded yet. You know, I, I think time will tell. Um, it's still out there. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep thinking about that one. Thank you. Perhaps one more question. So, thank you for sharing part of your life yeah. and work. And um, my question relates to you mentioning um, that early on your interest in textile and patterns also related to what, what it said about the particular context in terms of, you know, socio-political world that people were living in that were making this work. So what if one was a person from the future looking at these pieces here? What do you think this person would uh, deduce from that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because there's not, whereas the, you used to be able to track, you know, the evolution, I'm not sure that you can anymore because it's been so layered and so sort of, um, you know, obfuscated in terms of, you know, what our references are and, and where they come from. Um, so I don't know. I imagine there might be a tale spun about, I actually have no idea of <laughs> trying to analyze myself. Um, maybe just about the sort of quotidian nature of a very simple geometric design. Um, and I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of, in oh, sorry. Um, there are a lot of interpretations where people sort of um, associate, you know, from forms uh, uh, to humans, but I noticed that you mentioned yourself um, the pattern, for example, of a linoleum floor, mm -hmm. and that ties in with the quotidian, the domesticity, and so maybe it's about all these dramas that, that also play out uh, within uh, those settings. That, that, that was one particular reference that, that I noticed that you made that made me think of that. Yeah, I think that there's probably, there's, there's something there, and just in terms of how I think about my work and where I want it to live and where also it comes from. So I think that there's, um, yeah, I think that that's probably correct reading. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you thank all you so much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you.